Hi, everybody, and welcome to Cal Day. This is an information session for the Letters in Science Computer Science Program. Uh, I'm John Kenny, the current uh, chair of the Computer Science Division. Uh, I'm going to give a short introduction, and then I'm going to hand it off to John De Niro, who uh, runs our undergrad study committee and is the main uh, organizer and leader of the uh, lower division in the department. So first of all, congratulations and welcome. This is an information session. So it's primarily for uh, new admits to Berkeley. Others are welcome to listen in um, and get some background on the department, but mostly we're gonna cover topics that are specific to prospective computer science majors. All right, so I'm going to start with an overview of the department. <clears throat> um, so we're a department in a university and often departments live under larger level organizational structures, uh, which are colleges or divisions. We actually live both in a college of engineering and also a, a division of computing and data and social science. Um, and the respective leaders of those groups are uh, professor Sue J. King, uh, who is also a professor in our department. She's the head of the College of Engineering uh, and also a, a, an activist or a promoter of diversity in the university and in our department. And our other leader is Jennifer Chase, who's uh, fairly recently arrived. She's the Associate Vice Provost for the Division of Computing Data Science and Society uh, and also the Dean of the Information School. And uh, this is a little bit of an unorthodox arrangement, but it actually is really great for us um, in that we have two high level leaders who are supporting the department. Um, and Jennifer is a, a AI researcher, but also a promoter of interdisciplinary research and also diversity in our department. And so the department's mission, we're a research university and so the department is uh, charged with trying to create knowledge, come up especially with new fundamental approaches, principles and technologies. Um, and a lot of the work that we do is interdisciplinary. We recently hired two new faculty members, Radia Dabibi and uh, Nika Hagtalab, who both work on AI and its social implications. Um, and they're also working on the boundary between AI and economics. Um, and that's very typical of the the kind of leadership that we have in the department. Um, Berkeley is one of the strongest academic programs in the country. And so we're focusing on teaching and training students who are likely to go into leadership roles after Berkeley, um, certainly into academia, into professorships elsewhere, um, also government and industry and also entrepreneurship. So uh, focuses on developing your leadership and team skills while you're in the program. And part of Berkeley's DNA, um, as you might already know, and especially if you've come to Berkeley, is that um, Berkeley has a history through the civil rights movement of social action and social impact. And so um, you'll find in many, many parts of the department, both you know, within the formal uh, EECS department, there are mentorship programs, there are outreach programs, but even among the students themselves, the student organizations uh, include many orgs that are focused on um, outreach, direct social outreach, recruitment for diversity, um, and you know, generally trying to improve the climate, both for our own students and for people around the campus. So uh, I mentioned the strength of the department <clears throat> so in, in a typical ranking report, which is the US News's World Report rankings, uh, which come out every year. Our undergraduate programs are in the top two in the country um, across the board. Uh, also, uh, we're number two in um, overall graduate programs and computer science is number one. And the College of Engineering, which includes the other engineering departments, is also number two. So it's, it's enormous and consistent strength across the department. Um, and that means that you're interacting with leading researchers um, as well as great teachers. Okay, and uh, underscoring that is the list of awards. I won't do all of these, but I'll mention a few of them. 
Um, the National Medal of Science is the highest award in science. It's awarded by the president directly at that time. Um, and we have two winners of that award. The Turing Award is roughly a Nobel Prize for computer science. And we've had six winners of that award on the faculty. And um, also a very prestigious award for um, hardware is the Silicon Valley Hall of Fame. And as you can see, we've had eight winners of that award. Um, so, you know, consistent strength across the faculty and, you know, leadership at the highest levels. So Berkeley, we're a fairly large department, especially at the undergraduate level. We have about 110 regular faculty members, um, a lot of very active alumni um, and a few other titles, professors in residence, um, which who often interact a lot with industry and allow, you know, support collaborations between students and various companies, especially in the AI area, which is very important right now. Um, we have about 700 graduate students, uh, about 550 of those are in the PhD program and the rest are in one of the master's programs. And right now about 3,500 undergraduates in EECS. And so we have both uh, a direct to major admission in the College of Engineering. So um, 1,700 majors who go directly into the EECS major. And for the rest of you, the path into computer science is through declaration, uh, typically in uh, going into junior year. Uh, and that's the CS Bachelor of Arts degree. And there's currently about 1700 students in that program. Okay, EECS is uh, distributed across campus. There are two main buildings. Um, the main electrical engineering building is Corey Hall. It has classrooms and some student uh, hangout areas that you'll probably spend most of your time in if you're an EE student. Um, Computer science is mostly in Soda Hall, both the classrooms and the research facilities are there with a couple of exceptions. Um, <clears throat> so the exceptions are, first of all, Sutaja Dai Hall, uh, which is across the street or actually adjacent to Corey Hall and across the street from Soda. And this houses the new uh, fabrication facility, the Nano Lab, which is in this front section of the building here. Um, and Berkeley's traditionally had one of the most advanced um, fabrication facilities for silicon hardware for a long time. And this one is a nano lab, it's even more general. It supports, uh, you know, non-silicon technologies, biotechnologies, as well as, as silicon. Um, and there's also regular office space. So computer science and electrical engineering have grown very fast, as you might expect over the last two decades. And so we, we have spread out in several other buildings. So there's also other research activities, including AI in the um, other section of Satagia Dai Hall. Um, things got a bit too distributed. So we did uh, collect together the AI group and move it to Berkeley Way West, which is uh, about a block from the main campus in downtown Berkeley. And it has spectacular views of the bay, the, AI group occupies the top floor of that building. And it's a very nicely constructed open collaborative space with a lot of labs. Um, so if you're doing undergraduate research, you would uh, in AI you'd typically be in that space. Um, we have also the Simons Institute, which is a very prestigious and energetic program in research and theoretical computer science, also AI, um, and also interdisciplinary topics such as AI and the law, uh, which touch computer science, but often some other fields as well. And uh, it's in the Calvin Lab, which is an older building, but actually very well designed in terms of uh, formal and informal collaboration. So that's a great historical building on campus. And then finally, um, <clears throat> Jacobs Hall was um, donated by one of our alumni, Paul Jacobs, who was also the, uh, for many years, the leader of Qualcomm, a successful uh, phone company, phone chip company. And um, Paul and his wife Stacy donated this building, which is a fantastic uh, design slash maker space. So uh, there are classes from many departments, but certainly from EECS that are hosted in this building in a, a kind of a work workshop style or bench style uh, presentation. So with lectures, but also with um, a lot of prototyping machines um, and uh, 
in addition to taking classes there, you'd also have the opportunity just to get a maker pass. Uh, in fact, anyone in campus can do that and use the facilities in there for maker projects. So it's a fantastic resource. It's right next to uh, Soda Hall. Um, okay, so <clears throat> a distinguishing feature of Berkeley EECS is that it is an integrated EE um, and computer science department. And so the research areas in the department um, straddle those two themes, um, but still we're one department. We do occupy two different buildings primarily, but um, there's a, a lot of uh, overlap and flow between those buildings and various groups are distributed between the buildings as well. Um, but you can see there, you know, traditional computer science areas like programming systems and database management uh, on the right in theory and, and physical electronics sort of on the uh, left, far left in the E circle. But also there's many areas that fit in the middle. Uh, control robotics and AI are really pretty hard to distinguish. Uh, computational biology is really squarely in the middle. And, um, you know, a number of these other topics, security, design, modeling, networking, and so on, they, they really fit in between. And it's a strength that we are one department and we teach one set of courses and we have a joint major in EECS um, that we don't have to sort of be limited by those kind of boundaries. Okay, so um, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, there are two degree programs uh, for let's say computer science in the, uh, in the university. The first one is the Bachelor of Science in electrical, electrical Engineering and Computer Science within the College of Engineering. Um, slightly greater emphasis on physics and math uh, for College of Engineering programs. Uh, the Bachelor of Art in Computer Science is in the College of Letters and Science. It has a somewhat stronger breadth requirement, but still a lot of flexibility in the program that you actually create for yourself. And it, although the different programs, the, the core coursework, uh, the major coursework is essentially the same. So the choice between these majors, well, you would have made it already, but the choice is really about the, those other uh, additional classes that you would take through your program and, and the way that you identify, whether you feel like you end up identify as an engineer or as a letters and science major. So, um, at this point, I'm excited to turn it over to John De Niro, who's a, a legend uh, in our department. He's the winner of a campus teaching award, um, a, a fantastic lecturer, and uh, almost surely you'll you'll take at least one class from John in your program, uh, typically at the lower division, and possibly data science also if you teach if you uh, take a data science course. And he's going to uh, drill down and tell you about some more aspects of the program. So um, I'll turn it over to John at this point. Thanks everybody and welcome again to Berkeley. Hi everybody out there. My name is John De Niro. I've had the pleasure of teaching both computer science and data science here at Cal for several years. Uh, I really enjoy it. And I've been involved in both of those degree programs. So today we'll be talking about computer science um, which is one of the two programs that's wholly housed within the EECS department, which you just heard about. Um, and the other one is the EECS degree. So there's a EECS program and a CS program, both within the EECS department, which of course makes things as confusing as possible. But the good news is that they're essentially the same in terms of the course requirements. So if you're wondering whether to major in EECS or CS, that mostly is affected by which college you applied to when you joined the university. But what about the education that you'll receive based on these two different programs? Well, it's basically the same. And today we'll talk about computer science. So the overall structure of the degree is that there is a broad lower division that covers computer science, electrical engineering, and lots of things in the intersection because that's where a lot of the exciting action is. Um, and I'll talk about all of these courses in due time, but I just wanted to give you an overview of what it all looks like. You've got these courses that everybody takes. They're all really large as a result, but we try to make them feel small by breaking things up into small sections. 
And then we have a very open and flexible, but deep upper division. So these are the courses that you're taking in your junior and senior year. And they roughly align to different research areas within the department and they get pretty advanced. Uh, so if you're interested in databases or security or CS theory or robotics or physical electronics, you can learn a lot about that here at Berkeley. And it's up to you to decide which upper division courses to take. Some of these areas have multiple courses, some of them have one, but even one semester taught by, you know, a world-class faculty member here at Berkeley where we move at a pretty fast pace can get you pretty deep into a, a field. So your major coursework is gonna look like take the lower division and then take five upper division courses without many constraints on those. A couple of them do need to be computer science related. So you can't just take EE courses, but we have lots of computer science majors who do add a significant amount of electrical engineering into their coursework. And that's totally fine. There are additional breadth requirements for science, math, and technical breadth. I'm not gonna go through them all today because you can read about them in the course catalog. I'm just gonna focus on the courses that everybody takes because uh, I think that's probably the most useful for you to learn about now. That's really the, the foundation of the program. So the lower division has these courses I'll just give you a gist about what you'll learn in each one, and so you have a sense of how they fit together. 61A is about program structures. So it's called the structure and interpretation of computer programs. Um, it's really about how you get programs to do what you want them to do. Not so much about learning how to do things the fastest possible way, but how to get things to work correctly and organize large programs I've taught this course many times. I really enjoy teaching it. It is a course that tends to push students in ways that they don't expect. Even students who have a lot of prior programming experience tend to find that there's a lot that they learn in 61A. That's new material for them because we teach it in a different way than typical like AP courses or other universities. And students who have no background in computing before they take this course tend to work really, really hard in order to keep up. It's extremely fast paced. And it's very common that students will take something else beforehand just to get familiarity with computing. The best option is a course called CS10, which doesn't fulfill a major requirement, but teaches you a lot of interesting stuff, helps you get ready for 61A. So if you're coming in with no prior computing experience, I would recommend looking at CS10, which is called the beauty and joy of computing. And it is a course that teaches you a lot in a semester, uh, but at a pace that's more reasonable for someone with no prior programming experience. Some students also take a course called Data 8, which is the Foundations of Data Science. Not a programming course, but it does teach you some programming, and so that can help you get um, kind of oriented before you take 61A. And some students jump straight into 61A without prior computing or programming experience, uh, but for them, it's really fast-paced. So seriously consider taking another course beforehand. You're certainly not going to be behind if you do that. Uh, lots of people do it. So you learn how to structure programs so that they do what you want to do, 61B gives you an opportunity to learn about a bunch of different great ideas and discoveries that have happened in computer science over the decades. So we call it a data structures and algorithms course. What are those things? Well, these are basically inventions that people have come up with. Maybe you could come up with them on your own, but it took many decades for people to come up with them, the whole research community. And they're really the backbone for building efficient systems is to know how to use the right data structure for the right problem uh, the right algorithm in order to solve the right problem. Um, and there's just really clever stuff in there. So you get to learn all of that in 61B. But uh, while these two courses are programming oriented, there's a whole lot more to computer science than just programming. You also need to learn how to analyze programs, think about what computers can do, and uh, basically predict their behavior before you just run the program. Because this is not just a purely empirical discipline. This is something that you can reason about theoretically. And to get started in that, there's a course called CS70, Discrete Math with Probability Theory, which was a course designed specifically for this major that teaches you the foundational mathematics you need in order to really get ready to take all the other courses that are in the upper division. And lots of upper division courses rely on your understanding probability theory and other elements of discrete mathematics that you learn in 70. The third course in the 61 series is called Machine Structures. I think actually the title of the course is Great Ideas in Computer Architecture. 
it really is there to help you understand what's going on when the computer actually executes programs. And in order for a program to execute, there's got to be a lot of infrastructure set up. Great ideas about operating systems, chip design, programming language design, all come together so that you can understand what a lot of people who work in the computing industry don't have a really solid grasp of, but you really should, which is what actually happens when you run a program. Now, if you haven't done a lot of programming before, just learning about programming is the right way to start. That's why 61A comes first. And then really being able to build large and efficient programs comes next. That's why 61B is there. But if you really wanna be able to build anything, understand what it's like to build the software that's running in a car that's automating self-driving and therefore can't pause for a second in order to like reorient its memory or whatever. Because if you pause for a second when you're driving a car, you can run into something. Like these issues that really uh, depend on understanding exactly what the computer is doing when it's running programs is essential. And that's what happens in 61C. It's a good idea to build up to it. So you understand what kinds of programs you might be running, and then you understand how they run. Students are required to learn calculus. Some students pass out of this. Some students take it at Berkeley. Either way is fine. Certainly, if you haven't finished your calculus sequence already, you should take these early. Make sure that you're comfortable with that because uh, calculus ideas pop up in lots of different places in the curriculum. And a two course series, EECS 16A and 16B, is called Designing Information Devices and Systems. These are integrated courses that build on math, programming, and electrical engineering, including things like circuit design and signal processing in order to talk about how devices are created. This is more than just building computers. This is building sensors and robots and all kinds of things like that. Circuits, of course, a central part of all of that. Um, but the, the course really goes broad in terms of helping you understand what it takes to create devices in the world. But it is very mathematical because the goal is to understand the mathematics that's relevant to designing not just today's devices, but whatever will be built for the next several decades. So within this course sequence, you uh, learn about a branch of mathematics called linear algebra, but you learn how to apply it to uh, designing information devices and systems. And there is coordination across what you learn here and what you learn in the 61 series. So for example, the programming language that you use in 16A is the same as the one in 61A, which means the right way to approach it is to enroll in 61A and 16A at the same time. And you're learning two quite different things. One's about program structures, one's about devices and linear algebra, but there are interesting connections along the way. Okay, so the upper division coursework, you have to accumulate 27 units. You have to take five courses within the department. Uh, and here's the list of upper division CS courses. This changes all the time because faculty will create new courses based on what's going on in the research world or in industry uh, as they see fit. But, you know, here's a glance at all these different topics. And what are all these different topics? Well, I'd say that Berkeley has strong research groups, usually, you know, world-class top research groups in every major area within uh, electrical engineering and computer science. And so we have courses that help prepare you to get involved in that if you want. There's also a technical elective requirement. You take a couple courses um, from technical areas that don't need to be in computer science. You can take computer science courses, but a lot of students will take courses elsewhere. And that's definitely what I'd recommend is make sure that you get a real well-rounded education. You might be majoring in computer science, but if you only know computer science, well, that's kind of a limited view of the world. You can learn a lot about computer science and learn a lot about whatever interests you in addition to that, psychology or linguistics or music or biology. There's a tremendous amount of activity, both in academia and in industry at the intersection of these different disciplines. And so if you know something about two different things, well, that sets you up better, I think, than just kind of going deep in one. And, you know, sometimes students question me on this. They say, Does, is it really the case that learning astronomy is gonna help me land the job at 
uh, Airbnb as an introductory software developer that I really want? Well, I don't know, that's up to them. But remember that the education you learn here is not just to like get your first job, it's to support you throughout your career. And uh, if you find something that you're interested in that's narrower than just software engineering and uh, involves applications to a particular area like astronomy, well, having some foundational understanding of what that is, you know, what goes on in astronomy and how it's done is gonna be really important to opening up opportunities long-term in your career. At least that was true for me. So when I was an undergraduate, I didn't just study computer science. I also studied a lot of linguistics and philosophy and psychology because I really wanted to understand how language works and lots of different disciplines look at how language works. And that's still what I work on today in, is the intersection of kind of language understanding and uh, computer science, mostly in getting computers to automatically translate from one language to another, kind of like Google Translate. In fact, I used to work for Google Translate before I came to Berkeley, but Berkeley is my favorite place in the world, so I decided to come here. Okay, um, these pictures don't look at all like people in a pandemic because they were all taken before the pandemic happened, but we have great hope that we'll be able to bring the campus back together physically as a residential campus next academic year. I'm sure things will be a little bit different than they were in the past, but we have observed great value in having students come together and collaborate. And so we've set up our instructional laboratories in order to facilitate that. Some of them are filled with computers. Some of them are filled with specialized equipment. And some of them are just configured for students to like sit around and work together, even on written theoretical work. This does mean that you don't actually need like your own equipment in order to be a student here, though most students do have a personal laptop these days and choose to use that for most of their work. So like you can see here in this uh, computing lab, there are people just using their own laptops in addition to using the computers that we provide. And we try to support students in using whatever they prefer. But it really is important that people come together and uh, work on things together because this is a very collaborative discipline these days. In order to get something really important done in computing these days, usually requires a group of people working together, often people with multiple different talents that uh, complement each other. Uh, so if you can get used to working in that way while you're at Berkeley, you're set up to get wonderful things done in the world afterwards. Here's uh, Professor Bjorn Hartman working with some students. Uh, his specialty is in human computer interaction design. And the computer is not just a laptop, but it could be any computing device of which there are many varieties. You know, smart watches and phones and vehicles that drive themselves and all that kind of stuff. So we do try to make sure that we have both the right environment for students to work on those things together with faculty and project-based assignments so that if there's something you're really excited about, you have a chance to work on that. And if you're not quite sure what you're excited about yet, well, we'll create a bunch of projects for you so that you can get a sense of what it's really like to build a piece of software, to think about how to build a device, to think about how to study the interaction between a person and that device. All of that is within the scope of computer science and a lot of it happens here at Berkeley. It's pretty exciting stuff. We've also worked hard in the last few years to create space for students to get together, even when they're not in class, but they wanna work on classroom projects together or extracurricular projects together. So we have some space in Soda Hall and Quarry Hall for students to do that. Um, here's just a little bit about the program. Almost all students stay in the program who come to Berkeley. That's what this first year retention rate is. So this is a place that students come in order to finish their degree. Uh, the average time to a degree is actually a little less than four years. Lots of students take four years and that's great. But if for some reason you really want to finish in three or three and a half, it is certainly possible even without taking summer courses, as long as you plan your schedule just so. But that does require taking heavier course loads, which I don't always recommend. I mean, it really depends on the student. But even top students who are just excelling in the program will often take lighter course loads when they find courses they're really excited about so that they can invest additional time in those courses, not just to learn the basic material and pass the class, but to explore and you know work on optional extensions to projects 
So you might see this slide and think, oh, I can finish in three years instead of four, save a year of tuition. It's a reasonable choice, but also think about making sure that you get out of Berkeley what you want. And if that means learning some particular thing really well, well, don't take the course on that. At the same time, you're taking three other technical courses that are taking up all your time. It is quite common for um, CS majors to also major in something else. My personal perspective is that instead of accumulating majors, you should accumulate courses and knowledge. So I very strongly recommend that everybody take courses outside of computer science. The requirements are gonna make you do some of that, but do more than just what the requirements say. Like learn about the things that are interesting to you and you think you might wanna work on more in the future. And if it turns out that you take so many of those classes that you fulfill the degree requirements for some other major, well then great, you have two majors. But you know, having one major and reasonable amount of knowledge in another subject, I think is basically just as good. Um, though, you know, if you have a sense of what people tend to pair with computer science, well, they tend to be the large majors on campus anyway, economics, stats, applied math, math and cognitive science. I suspect this slide is a little bit out of date. Now that we have a data science program that's extremely popular, it's probably one of the more common double majors as well. So beyond just taking classes, lots of students have interaction with faculty, which I would encourage you to, to take advantage of. It's optional, it's a good idea though. Uh, we have faculty office hours, all faculty hold office hours. You can just drop in and talk to them. In the first week of the semester, they tend to be pretty busy because everybody decides they wanna go meet their professors. And uh, that um, might seem too crowded, but then by the third or fourth week of the semester, Office hours have plenty of space for you to have extended individual conversations with faculty. So, you know, it just get your timing right. And uh, you can have plenty of faculty interaction here. We also have faculty advising sessions, which tend to be more oriented toward, you know, what students will do after Berkeley or uh, which courses to take in order to kind of uh, explore a particular topic that's interesting to them. Uh, we also organize some faculty student lunch meetings and have undergraduate social hours where basically students come and faculty come and everyone can talk to each other. There are a ton of other events that don't fall under these categories. Like here's a photo from the um, 2018 Richard Tapia Celebration of Diversity in Computing. Uh, we host a lot of events on campus. So there's lots of other places to interact with faculty and graduate students. The graduate students here at Berkeley are often on their way to become faculty at other universities. So it's like a whole other pool of pre-professors is a good way to think about it. Um, the faculty are very keen on teaching and uh, you know, build the courses, but there's a lot more to this program than just courses. And all of that is built by an amazing team of uh, staff in the EEC Center for Student Affairs. So it's EEC's department, which includes the computer science major, uh, these folks are supporting the computer science major. Uh, there's a bunch of them. I hope you uh, meet them, that you talk to them. They're very interested in talking to you. Um, and if you want to know how to get something done around here, well, they've seen it all and they've helped students um, figure out how to execute the plans that they want, whether it's they want to go study abroad or they want to get involved in research or whatever it is that is exciting to you. Um, there's someone here on this page who could help you figure that out. I am proud and delighted to say that we just have a fantastic team uh, in this department and uh, I love working with them and I hope you will too. Uh, I, I just wanna say that the way most people approach Berkeley who are really successful here is that they use the resources that are available, that they learn from others, that they accept the fact that they're not gonna understand every technical idea immediately when they hear about it and that they're gonna have to go uh, work through it. And it's better not to work on it just by yourself, but work on it with people who have seen it before and can help you understand um, what you're supposed to learn. So that means going to tutoring. Tutoring here is not for people who are falling behind. It's for people who want to master the material and become great which is most students. So uh, if you wanna learn more about something or you're not quite sure you've fully understood everything there is to understand about some topic in a class, 
uh, please come to some drop-in tutoring. Some of them is affiliated with courses, so you'll hear about it there. And then when you're in courses, we'll uh, announce these different opportunities um, that uh, come from student groups as well as staff-run programs. Get advice. You know, you can read all the web pages about what all the courses are, but that might not tell you everything there is to know about which course to take and when. And that means you should talk to advisors. We have peer advisors, they're students who have been through the program and tried to understand uh, what's a you know good path and what to take first in order to get that first internship or whatever it is that you're looking for. Uh, and we have faculty advising, which I talked about. And we have mentoring programs that extend beyond just learning technical material to also becoming a successful part of the community um, and contributing back. You know, we think of it as our mission to develop people as you know, very productive leaders in society. And that means more than just mastering how to write a program. It also means learning how to understand, you know, which problems need to be solved and uh, how to communicate about them all sorts of other important things too. Um, and you know, we try to fold that into our mentoring programs. Lots of students get involved in student organizations. Here's a list of them. I'll just let you read it while I ramble on and say that I think the student organizations are great here. And there's a lot of them. Make sure you don't just focus on the first one you hear about and only wanna be part of that because if you uh, investigate lots of different organizations, that's how you find the right group of people. Um, that you're going to enjoy spending time with. And student organizations run lots of events. Those events often involve faculty, and um, it's a really nice way to get interaction with the whole Berkeley community, is to participate in an event that's run by one of these groups, or maybe even join a group. We have lots of resources in campus for fostering entrepreneurship. Lots of faculty and alumni have founded companies, some of which have become large public companies. Uh, the venture capital community is very interested in Berkeley students and making sure that like the next great idea has the right resources, which usually means money um, in order to make a difference. We have a fellowship program that supports faculty who are interested in creating new companies or industry ventures and lots of X faculty have participated in that. Um, and we have a student-oriented Excel Scholars program that you might want to look into if you're interested in entrepreneurship. Don't start a company the day you land on campus. Like, learn something first. But as you go through, if what you really want to do is build a new company, well, learn about how to do it while you're a student so that you have a leg up. Here's even more. We have an incubator program for startups called the Foundry, which gives you access to lab space and mentorship and uh, you know, people will even help you build prototypes of whatever you're creating. Um, kind of related to entrepreneurship, but not the same, is about designing new things. Uh, we have a new Jacobs Institute for Design and Innovation, which has an associated building full of maker spaces. You know, the bottom floor of this building here has 3D printers and all kinds of tools. You can basically create anything that you want down there. The upper floors are collaborative uh, teaching and workspaces where uh, students have done all kinds of interesting human computer interaction work and design work. Uh, so that's really something that is, is central to the experience at Berkeley, if that's what you're interested in. And the building's awesome. Like a lot of students were polled about what's their favorite building on campus. And uh, this, this Jacobs Hall got a lot of votes. So go check it out. Okay, let me wrap up by just saying a little bit about um, what happens if you study computer science. Well, you learn about computer science. You can do with that whatever you want. We need more people who understand computer science in government, in nonprofits, in industry, you know, large companies that are tech companies hire a lot of software engineers, but companies who aren't traditionally tech companies also need technology and they're uh, looking for people who understand this stuff as well. So, uh, we also have a very active research community. You know, Berkeley is one of the hubs of computer science research in the world, uh, and undergraduates get involved in that all the time. Uh, look up Beehive as a good place to start. People list projects there, and you can read about them. But sometimes you just have to go to faculty office hours and ask them about what they're up to, or um, you know, talk to other students and learn about their undergraduate research opportunities. Uh, we do help students link up with 
companies, organizations, government positions, etc., in order to um, in order to start their career. You can do that as an intern before you graduate, or you can get a job after you graduate. A lot of students do do internships because it's a great way to explore a field and build up um, some kind of credibility that you know how to do this stuff so that uh, people will hire you. Uh, I, there's a bunch of logos here, but this is not particularly representative of the companies that come to Berkeley, I think. Like um, there's a, lot, a long, long list of companies that come to Berkeley looking for um, students to join their internships programs. Um, you know, most of those come after your sophomore or junior year. Uh, if you look really, really, really hard, you could find one after your freshman year, but it usually means applying to tons and tons of places, not just the big companies, but some small ones as well. Yeah, and I don't know what these companies did to get on the slide, whether there's like another hundred more um, logos, uh, but you know, there's just like uh, so much interest in students studying um, anything related to computing uh, here on campus that you will have no trouble having kind of first introductions to companies. And we do try to facilitate that with a recruiting event. Oh, there's some more logos. Uh, we have an honors program. You can read about it, but it is a way for students to pair what they're doing in EECS with some outside focus. And if you do really well at both of those, you can be part of the honors program, which means you get some specialty fac special faculty advising and additional research experience. And there's a dinner. Sometimes I get invited to that dinner, which is pretty fun. Uh, we have a fifth year master's degree program. So this is for students who um, finish in four years, they spend their fifth year here as well and earn a master's degree in one year. It is possible to finish your undergrad degree in three years and spend your fourth year in this fifth year master's program. Now that might sound very appealing because in four years you get both a bachelor's and a master's degree, but don't race too much because you actually want to enjoy those years and learn things along the way. Just cramming in more courses does not mean you learn more knowledge. You have to have enough uh, attention for each course that you can actually learn the material. So uh, it is possible, and you know, students ask me this a lot, which is why I bring it up. But uh, for the vast majority of students, they uh, do the fifth year master's program in their fifth year. Uh, and um, it's a way to start working on, on graduate courses. You have to do quite well in the undergraduate program. Um, so here's a minimum GPA, but you have to apply and uh, the space is limited. So some students have uh, even higher uh, GPAs than this. But another important part is that you have to do a master's project. And so you have to find which faculty member you'd work with. Okay, I'm just gonna wrap up by saying that we have a wonderful community here. People really wanna learn a lot. They wanna help each other. You know, for some reason, there's a reputation that Berkeley is a competitive place that is not really true in computer science in my observation. Instead, it's a challenging place where it's never easy to learn everything that you're supposed to learn, but it's a very collaborative place where people are working hard and they're working together to support each other in order to, uh, you know, have the whole Cal Bear Berkeley community uh, become as successful as they can be. Um, and, you know, it, it all does radiate out from the fact that the faculty here are top of their game in terms of research. And um, therefore, we attract lots of people to campus, uh, graduate students, postdoctoral fellows, undergraduates, who are interested in being part of that cutting edge discovery process. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think that's kind of the core of our community which has led to some really exciting learning and teaching opportunities as well. And our undergraduate program is meant to be flexible with an emphasis on teamwork and research opportunities. The flexibility is that you can choose which upper division courses you wanna take. The teamwork happens even from the very beginning in the lower division and the research opportunities tend to follow those upper division courses. So once you really learn about a subject because you took the upper division security course, now maybe you're ready to learn about security research. Uh, and I'll wrap up by saying that this faculty, which is amazing at research, is also remarkably dedicated to undergraduate education.
and graduate education too, but they care about the undergraduate experience quite a bit. Uh, they spend you know, long hours trying to make sure that their courses are worthwhile. That rarely means making them easy. It often means making them really uh, impactful. And we try to cultivate a culture of success, which means support. You know, students who wanna work on this are given support so that if they're ever struggling, well, they have a path to mastering the material anyway, through tutoring, mentoring, uh, whatever they need in order to succeed. Now, I say we're a really supportive culture and probably what is on everybody's mind is, well, isn't there a GPA cap to even get into the computer science major? That doesn't sound very supportive. Let me just address that because I think it's important to think about and it is important for your planning because the GPA uh, threshold requirement in order to declare computer science is to have 3.3 in 61A, 61B, and 70. And that's not easy to achieve at all. You know, these are challenging courses with a lot of material in them. Um, and you know, Berkeley's not known for great inflation. So there is a restriction on who's allowed to declare computer science at Berkeley. We are very committed to supporting students while they're in those courses so that they have you know, a fair shot of achieving that um, requirement. And if they're struggling, they have something that they can do about it. You know, enroll in more tutoring and mentoring and spend more time on the course usually leads to greater success in the course. But the amount of demand on this campus for computer science is beyond what we're able to teach in the upper division. And that's the reason that we have a GPA requirement in order to declare computer science. It's really not because like students who don't meet the GPA requirement are incapable of doing useful stuff in computing. We, we know that's not true. There are amazing students who don't meet the GPA requirement, but we do have a capacity problem in the sense that we can only you know, teach so many people. And you might wonder, couldn't we just make the courses bigger? And we've done that already, but the amount of demand for computer science on this campus has grown much faster than the size of the faculty. And as a result, we're just not in a position to teach everybody in every upper division course that they wanna take. And so the mechanism for controlling that flow right now is to have this GPA threshold. That's what's gonna to apply to you if you're joining the campus in fall 2021. And that is gonna add some stress to your first couple of years. Uh, the good news is that even if you don't get very high grades in ZS61A and 61B and 70, and therefore you don't declare the computer science major, there are lots of other computing related programs on campus that are available to you. Uh, data science, applied math, cognitive science, all have a lot of computing in them. So if that's what you're into, there's still plenty of great stuff to do. Uh, you tend to shift your focus a little bit. You're not gonna, if you don't major in computer science, you're not just gonna take computer science courses. You're gonna take other courses too and uh, learn a lot of depth about something else. But you'll still have taken the lower division, you know, those core courses in programming and data structures that are really essential to any kind of uh, software engineering related uh, work that you might do later. So we have lots of students who don't major in computer science, but still get involved in the technology industry in lots of different ways, and that's fine. So what I'm suggesting is uh, we will try to keep our courses as collaborative and supportive as possible, but the added stress of needing high grades to declare computer science is real, and it's going to be something that you'll have to, um, you'll have to think about. The best way to approach it is typically just to focus on learning the material really well and uh, you know the grades tend to follow. But at Berkeley, you know, even if you don't meet the computer science declaration requirement, you're still a Berkeley student. You're still going to receive lots of great uh, opportunities. You just will have a harder time getting into upper division computer science courses because they're impacted, meaning that there are more students who want to take them than there are seats. So the lower division is generally open and the upper division tends to be restricted to students who are declared majors. This is not strictly true. There are particular courses that have students enrolling from across campus. In fact, our most popular ones in artificial intelligence and machine learning tend to look like that. 
but it's not the case that every Berkeley student has access to every computer science class that they want to take. And the way that's mostly regulated is by uh, having limit to who can declare the computer science major. And then once you declare the computer science major, you have priority enrollment in the upper division courses. Okay, so I ended on this kind of stressful note, which is that there's some uncertainty about whether you can declare computer science. I think Berkeley's still a great place to be, even with that, because lots of students are successful in meeting the GPA requirement. Lots of students who are having a hard time meeting that GPA requirement discover that there's some other major that's even more exciting to them, or at least as exciting to them as computer science. And historically, students have been able to take the lower division courses that let them build up that foundational understanding that's necessary for kind of further learning and computing. It's really the upper division courses that are the hardest to get into. And the lower division courses are the ones that are most popular. You might think like, oh, they're lower, so they're not as good, but they really are the things that teach you the most important material. And uh, the upper division courses are more specialized. All right, I hope that's helpful. I'm sure you have questions. If you do, what I would suggest is that you email csadvising at cs.berkeley.edu with your questions. Or you can make an appointment with an advisor and talk to them. So I hope you asked those questions. I hope this info session was helpful. Um, I hope you come to Berkeley if you're thinking about whether to come here. Uh, and wherever you decide to go to college, I hope you have a wonderful time. And if I see you next fall, please introduce yourself. I'm John, and I look forward to meeting you.